Happy Sunday. And welcome to the First Congregational Church in Kalamazoo. We are here on the third Sunday of Easter, and I am the Reverend Sarah Schmidt Lee. I am delighted to be sharing worship leadership this morning with our liturgist, Sharon Williams, and with our guest preacher, the Reverend Eric Strickland. (laughs) Eric grew up in the Portage UCC Church and is a friend to this congregation and was um, certified, examined and certified for ordination in the chapel right here at our church about, what, five, six years ago? Yeah. So we are delighted to have him back Um, preaching for us this morning and joining with us in worship. The First Congregational Church in Kalamazoo is a member church in the United Church of Christ. And every time we gather together, we reaffirm that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. Good morning. I'm Sharon Williams, and I've been a member of First Congregational Church since 1991. Um, I participate in the worship arts ministry team, um, which is responsible for much of what you see on a Sunday um, and what you hear. (laughs) Um, I'm also active in Soul Sisters and Bible study, and from time to time, I serve as a welcome host. Welcome. (laughs) Um, I'd like to invite you now to rise in body or spirit and join me, please, in the call to worship and our opening hymn. Friends, hear the good news. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Weeping may last the night, but joy comes in the morning. God's love cannot be contained by anything, not even death. Thanks be to God, who has opened the way to life. Christ is risen. Alleluia.
Please join me in the opening prayer for the season of Easter. Almighty God, through the rising of your beloved one from the grave, you broke the power of the grave. You broke the power of death and condemned death itself to die. As we celebrate this great triumph, may we also make it the model for our living. Help us to identify in our lives all that should rightly die, redundant desires, tired habits, fruitless action. Resurrect in our lives faith, hope, and love as surely as you raise Jesus Christ from the grave. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us share Christ's peace with one another. any children who would like to take part in this morning's blessing. What's that? <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> so, we have someone to thank today. Shaylee, who has been the scholar for the Worship Our Ways program, this is her last Sunday with us because her semester is about to end at school. So those of you who haven't had a chance to meet Shaylee, Shaylee has been a fantastic addition as a scholar with the WOW program this year, assisting with both our children and the middle schoolers in our Worship Our Ways program. So can you guys thank Shaylee by clapping and the grown-ups can join in. Thank you, Shaylee. And our blessing today can include a blessing for Shaylee as she finishes up her semester and goes home for the summer. But I also wanted to ask you guys, so sometimes a butterfly is a symbol that we use to think about the resurrection. Do you have any idea why we would use a butterfly to help us think about the resurrection? Does a butterfly start its life as a butterfly? No. How does it start its life? As a caterpillar. As a caterpillar. And how does it go from being a caterpillar to becoming a butterfly? It makes its cocoon and then transforms. Yeah, so it goes into a chrysalis. And you know what I learned? I didn't learn this till I was an adult. Butterflies don't build their chrysalis the way that other insects build cocoons. Butterflies become, like the caterpillar becomes a chrysalis. It's actually its body that turns into a chrysalis. And then all the insides of its body turn into goo so that it can change shape and become a butterfly next. So, Isn't that crazy? So my class got caterpillars. You, you've been able to see some of this? Crystallizing oh. and so so you're watching this happen why, why in your classroom? Why does it turn into goo? 
Why does it turn into goo? Well, because the body parts that it has as a caterpillar aren't the same body parts it needs as a butterfly. So it needs to turn into goo so that it can then turn into the new thing. Isn't that weird? So right now my class of caterpillars are going to turn into goo. Uh-huh. And then into butterflies. That's right. You know, and one of the reasons I think that sometimes we use butterflies to talk about the resurrection is that after Jesus resurrected, when he was back to life, did you know that people didn't always recognize him? It took Mary a while to recognize him. It took the other disciples a while to recognize him. We don't know why. But maybe... Maybe. Maybe, maybe it was that they were just so surprised to see someone who had died alive again. But also, maybe Jesus looked so different that it took a while for them to recognize him, and they had to recognize him by what he did. What did you want to share, Oliver? Well, I think butterflies are the end of their life. So that butterfly is the last thing it turns into. So I want you all to listen. When we hear the Bible this morning and when we hear Pastor Eric preach, I want you guys to listen for how the disciples recognize Jesus. Because they start out by not recognizing Jesus, and then something happens and they recognize Jesus. So I want you to listen for what that is. You think Jesus says their names? Maybe so. I want you to listen and see if that's what happens. All right? You ready for the blessing? Let's all raise a hand. Dear God. Thank you for Jesus, who is with us in unexpected places. Bless Shaylee as she goes home this summer, and bless each of us today and always. Amen. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Sarah, for that um, biology lesson. I did not know that about, <clears throat> about the chrysalis. Thank you. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 49. I'll be reading from the Inclusive Bible, which is slightly different from the New Revised Standard Pew Bible that you have, but you can follow along, and it's pretty similar. That same day, two of the disciples were making their way to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem, discussing all that had happened as they went. While they were discussing these things, Jesus approached and began to walk along with them, though they were kept from recognizing Jesus, who asked them, What are you two discussing as you go your way? They stopped and looked sad. One of them, Cleopas by name, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened these past few days? Jesus said to them, What things? They said, about Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet powerful in word and deed in the eyes of God and all the people, how our chief priests and leaders delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. We were hoping that he was the one who would set Israel free. Besides all this, today, the third day since these things happened, Some women of our group have just brought us some astonishing news. They were at the tomb before dawn and didn't find the body. They returned and informed us that they had seen a vision of angels who declared that Jesus was alive. Some of our number went to the tomb and found it to be just as the women had said, but they didn't find Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, What little sense you have. 
How slow you are to believe all that the prophets have announced. Didn't the Messiah have to undergo all this to enter into glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted for them every passage of Scripture which referred to the Messiah. By now, they were near the village they were going to, and Jesus appeared to be going further. But they said eagerly, Stay with us. It's nearly evening. The day is practically over. So the Savior went in and stayed with them. <clears throat> After sitting down with them to eat, Jesus broke bread, said the blessing, then broke the bread and began to distribute it to them. With that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized Jesus, who immediately vanished from their sight. They said to one another, Weren't our hearts burning inside us as this one talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? They got up immediately and returned to Jerusalem, where they found the eleven and the rest of the company assembled. They were greeted with, Christ has risen. It's true. Jesus has appeared to Simon. Then the travelers recounted what had happened on the road and how they had come to know Jesus in the breaking of the bread. <clears throat> While they were still talking about this, Jesus actually stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. In their panic and fright, they thought they were seeing a ghost. Jesus said to them, Why are you disturbed? Why do such ideas cross your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, really. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as I do. After saying this, Jesus showed them his wounds. <clears throat> They were still incredulous for sheer joy and wonder. So Jesus said to them, Do you have anything here to eat? After being given a piece of cooked fish, the Savior ate in their presence. Then Jesus said to them, Remember the words I spoke when I was still with you. Everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms had to be fulfilled. Then Jesus opened their minds to the understanding of the scriptures, saying, That is why the scriptures say that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. <clears throat> In the Messiah's name, repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached to all nations, <clears throat> beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of all this. Take note, I am sending forth what Abba God has promised to you. Remain here in the city until you are clothed with the power from on high. Hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Oh, friends, good morning. I... Uh, I've got to start by sharing with you that I've been amused this morning from my seat and actually with my seat. And my two cents, uh, if you're all going to be having guest preachers for a little while, is that a fun Sunday game to play would be to not communicate who the guest preacher is and to just be surprised by who emerges <laughs> from the hidden chair in the wall. I think it could be, I think it could be fun. Uh, friends, as Sarah introduced me, and I, I'm so thankful for the invitation to come and, and uh, share a time of worship with you. My name is Reverend Eric Strickland, and um, a little bit of history and connection with this congregation. First of all, many, many friends who worship and belong to this church, um, but also, as Sarah said, I was approved for ordination uh, in your chapel, um, grew up down the road at Portage UCC, and I bring you greetings and blessings from the fine people whom I serve at St. Paul United Church of Christ down the road, down 94 aways in Chelsea, Michigan, um, who I hope are having a happy Sunday as well. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, it is so good for us to be here as strangers, neighbors, friends, co-sojourners on this journey together. 
May we recognize your resurrected life in the space that we create together and for one another, for the ways in which we accommodate the needs of our bodies, for the ways in which we advocate for each other and in the breaking of bread. I pray now, O oh God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable unto you, our rock, redeemer, and sustainer forever. Amen. So I, I think, and I believe this in my heart, that one of the essential truths, one of the more important things about our faith tradition as Christians is that we say, we believe that the body matters, that bodies matter, that a resurrected body on some level matters. Literally, our physical bodies matter and matter to God. The gift of incarnation of which we speak in our tradition, which says that God became flesh, is a testament to this truth. And it means that bodies matter to God and ought to matter to us, especially as we live in a world that so routinely disdains and oppresses bodies. It's good news. It's good news that bodies matter to God and are holy. Because I think, to, I think it gives us at least a little bit of clarity regarding what we're supposed to do while we're here, both for ourselves and for one another together. There's a lot going on with bodies in this story from Luke that Sharon has read for us this morning. And by now, I, I don't think that there are really many surprises. At least I don't think so, but I'm always open to being surprised by a surface, on the surface level, by a story in Scripture. But I, I don't think there are a whole lot of surprises, at least on that surface level, of Luke's story about two of Jesus' disciples, two of his closest friends, journeying on a road to a town called Emmaus, just days after Jesus had been crucified and buried in a tomb. It comes up in our lectionary, if we're lectionary preaching churches, two out of every three years, so we're pretty used to it. Even if there is stuff just below the surface that's interesting and worth digging into, and there, there definitely is, I just want to hang out on the surface with this story and poke around at some of the obvious stuff, if we don't mind this morning. I want to just look at the basics, and I think that we'll find some good guidance, and I think that we'll find some good news for our days together just there and the basics of this story. On the Sunday, where we meet these characters in this story, on the Sunday after he had been crucified, these two friends of Jesus are making their journey from Jerusalem, where he had been killed and buried, to a town called Emmaus, which we don't know that much about. And on that journey, Jesus, raised and in the flesh, shows up to walk with them and to talk with them as a companion. But to them, as we've heard, he seems a stranger. They don't recognize him, even a little bit. And they even take the time to explain to him what had happened to him in the days before. His arrest, his crucifixion, his burial, and the events that preceded all of this. I don't know why they didn't recognize him. I have no idea. I, I guess the best exegesis of the text might say that Luke wrote it this way in order to drive home the dramatic revelation at the end of the story when they do finally recognize Jesus gathered around a shared meal. It's a good setup. Otherwise, I have no idea. I don't know why they didn't recognize him. Perhaps it was the astonishment of having seen somebody who had been dead, now alive. That adds up too. But also, maybe we can wonder if they were disoriented by grief and fear, both of which are disorienting. All of that makes sense. But eventually they all, the disciples and this stranger, who's actually Jesus, arrive at the place where they were headed and starting to get dark. And so it seems to occur quite naturally to these two disciples of Jesus to invite this assumed stranger to stay the night with them. Because a person and their body need safe shelter and food and drink, a place to be, a place to be safe and cared for. And so they shared a table and a meal and more conversation the strangers to this man invest even just a small part of what they are able. Space, food, drink, time, a place to rest, into the well-being of somebody who had been a stranger. 
They care enough to offer what they can to attend to the physical, bodily needs of another person. The shelter, the meal, the company, which shouldn't be lost on us. Good company. And then they recognize, of course, that it was Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ, in their midst the entire time. They recognize him as it goes in the breaking of bread. They believe in the resurrection because in the shared space, food, and hospitality with the resurrected body of Christ. Now, I don't know Kalamazoo quite the way that I used to, though I grew up in the area. But I think it's pretty true across the board that we manage, as people who live in towns and in communities, to coexist in broad community with folks who are basically strangers to us, even if we are actually neighbors, technically. It's easy to stay inside and miss each other, but to kind of coexist together. And then I also remember a Frederick Beekner quote that a beloved seminary professor and mentor named Dow Edgerton once taught me in a class on grief, which goes like this. In any one town, at any time, anywhere, there is grief enough to freeze the blood. In any one town, anywhere, there is grief enough to freeze the blood. And so I think whether we know each other or not, people go through a lot. People go through a lot. Not just grief because of death and loss, but people's bodies and spirits bear deep wounds of all kinds. That's why I belong to the church and have most of my life. But I say that realizing that I'm pretty lucky, I'm pretty privileged. The church for me has always harbored me and attended to my wounds and celebrated my healing and rejoiced at my thriving. Which as we know isn't so for all bodies, all people. And I pray every day that the church will be the gathering at the end of the road to Emmaus for all people whose bodies need a place to break bread and belong and rest and to be celebrated and encouraged. I don't know that we can recognize the resurrected Christ in our neighbors who have been wounded by a world that hates their very bodies unless we are willing on some level to break bread, to share life with them, to offer of ourselves what we have to offer, time, space, food, money, solidarity with our own bodies sometimes, and so on. Now, I, I love this church here at FCC and the legacy you all have of being this kind of community of faith, so I don't intend this morning to really offer a lecture. I'm not trying to teach you something new or break new ground, delivering new information to you that hospitality is important and that the physical as well as spiritual needs of the people of God matter. I, I know that you know that. I'm here from across the state this morning to encourage you all, I think, to offer words of encouragement and my prayers, to hold fast in this world that so often disdains and oppresses so many bodies and creates ways of keeping folks out. Hard, hold fast, because it's hard work Every body isn't as free and safe and celebrated, loved, and cared for as others. Again, I'm not breaking new news to you. There's a lot of hate and fear of supposed strangers in the world, and it sells. It sells a lot, makes a lot of money. It's getting harder in some ways. We could be tempted into believing that there are a lot more strangers sojourning with us than what is true. Don't believe it. Don't believe it. Don't listen. Hold fast to that which is good. I pray, I pray often, as the church, as Christ's disciples, that we will listen well and travel the road to where we are going well and see ourselves as companions to one another on that journey, but especially that the church will continue to care for people who have been wounded, folk who need a place to stay, who are hungry and thirsty, literally hungry and thirsty, not just for the spiritual food that we offer in our spaces of worship and in community, but folks who are hungry and thirsty, folk who need space to heal, and not just to come and stay broken, but folk who need to be celebrated on their way to thriving, 
And church, let us be a space for folk who need to just enjoy some plain good company. It's a long road, and a lot of folks could use some company on their journey, but especially a place to be and good folks to be with. My prayer is that the church, this church, my church, our church universal in Christ's name will be the place where Jesus Christ is at last recognized in the breaking of bread, the sharing of life amongst people on a journey together. May it be so. Amen.
it's come to the time when we share our gifts. Having received such gifts from God and through this church, this is our opportunity in worship to offer thanks with gifts of our own. Please also take a moment to fill out your connection card and put that in the offering basket as it comes your way. <clears throat> if you do not have time to complete it before the basket arrives, you may place it in one of the <clears throat> baskets at either of the exits. <clears throat> Both our finances and the sharing of our time and talents, as outlined on the connection cards, help our ministries to continue to grow and to be a blessing to God's beloved world. <clears throat> At this time, the ushers will please come forward to pass the baskets for our offerings. Loving God, you are the source of every good thing in our lives, and we give you thanks. We bring before you these gifts dedicated to your work of love and justice and peace. 
dedicated to the work of bringing good news into the lives and hearts and bodies of all those we encounter. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, I'm the Reverend Caroline Myers. I've been part of the pastoral staff here at FCC for about the last year and a half and for about another month. And, uh, and it's always a joy to, to be with you in, in worship. I wanna draw your attention in the pink insert to those joys and concerns, the folks for whom we pray. We lift up as part of the Southwest Association Prayer Project a different group within the Association of Churches, uh, UCC churches in this area of which we're a part. And so this day we pray for the Southwest Association Church and Ministry Committee and the names of those on the committee. That committee meets uh, every month, uh, usually at Portage United Church of Christ. And so it is lovely to have members of Portage United Church of Christ and friends of PUCC that are here with us this day as well. And I lift up also the other names that are on this list and invite you to, to keep them in your hearts and minds as we join together in prayer. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, in the beginning, you created. You created the heavenly bodies and this earth, our island home. And you created our bodies, and you called it good. You called it very good. And so we give you thanks that we this day can gather in these bodies that are at times compromised and fearful, both strong and weak, appreciative of the opportunity to gather and still reeling from the residual fear of a virus that continues to have its hold on bodies around the world. We ask this day that you would help us to meet you both in body and in spirit. We give you thanks for the ministry of hospitality of this church and of other bodies of churches around the globe, for ways that we are able to reach out to our neighbors and offer companionship, a place of rest, a place of healing, a place of hope, a place of recognition. And may that continue to be so in this, this church. And God, we pray for the bodies of your children everywhere who hurt, who grieve, who suffer. We pray for our neighbors who are incarcerated, for the isolation and the fear and the histories that brought them to that place and ask that you would help our communities see them into a different future. We pray for the bodies of those who are hungry, particularly the children around the world. We give you our prayers of hope for those who are fearful, who live in the situation of war, who do not know where the next attack will come from. We ask that you would give them strength. We ask that our prayers might be felt by them in ways that lift their spirits and strengthen their bodies. 
We pray for those who are orphaned, no matter at what age, who feel themselves wandering in the world. And for all who are lonely. And God, we pray for those who are wealthy and privileged and sheltered, that you also might open their eyes that you might open our eyes to see you in each and every person we encounter. Holy God, in both neighbors and friends and strangers that we meet, may we see your presence. May we recognize you shining in them. And even as we, in our own blindness, try at times to tell you who you are. Open our eyes to see you in new ways and in new people so that together in the breaking of the bread, we might become whole and holy. We ask all this in the name of Jesus who opened our eyes to you and who invited his followers and friends to pray together in these words, saying together, Our mother and father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As I invite Christy Droppers, our moderator, to come forward and share with us some announcements, I would like to emphasize the announcement that I believe we've got in, yes, in the pink uh, insert. Next Saturday, the 29th of April, from 12.30 to 4.30 at Tower Hill Camp and Conference Center, which is about an hour away from here in Sawyer, Michigan, all members and friends of all the UCC churches in the Southwest Association are invited to just come and have fun. The Southwest Association Council is going to provide burgers and uh, veggie burgers and buns and libations and the place, which is an amazing place to go wander, explore, see the beach, gather, walk in the woods. It's just, it's a place of great spirit and joy. Uh, and you're invited to bring a side dish or a dessert to pass and then just come have fun with other members of churches in the association. We'd love it if you can do that. And I'm the person that you get to RSVP to. So um, my e email is in the bulletin. Would love it if you can come and be part of that. Um, if you could let me know by Wednesday, I'll make sure I get enough supplies for all. Thanks. Christy. Good morning. My name is Christy Droppers, and as Caroline said, I am the moderator of our church this year. For those of you who are new to our church or visiting, the moderator is like our lay leadership. And as part of um, our tradition, but also our bylaws, we are required to read aloud as well as print any congregational meeting and allow me to do that now. Here within is the official announcement. A special meeting of the membership of First Congregational Church will be held on Sunday, April 30th, 2023 in the sanctuary. The meeting will take place at the end of our 10 a.m. worship service. The membership will meet for the purpose of voting to approve the budget. That is next Sunday. Have a couple other announcements, one of which is to really encourage you how many times when you come to church do you get a free ticket. You all received a free ticket that this will get you in the door today for um, 
Free at Last, Thank God, Almighty, We Are Free at Last concert. Um, this is the Kalamazoo Children's Chorus pre um, presents today at three o'clock. Let's fill this room. I hope to attend myself. Second, I want to thank all of you who showed up and helped Diane. Um, you are the FCC angels and um, helped us start, if not almost complete, the emptying of our downstairs area and removing all the things we no longer need. Apparently, um, we literally took a truck, two truckloads, a trailer, and an SUV um, to be recycled and reused. And there's a couple more tables out there. They're going fast, that's what I heard. You better grab them. Please do. Um, last announcement is, it's Benjamin's, um, Benjamin, as he prefers, who's not here today. His last Sunday is next Sunday. And um, I'm, I know you can't say anything to him today, but we will recognize um, his contribution um, to us next Sunday, but he's leaving to focus on more of what his gifts entail, which most of us don't really get to experience here, and that's his music. Um, with that, with his leaving, we are going to continue to obviously video and record our sermons and our services here. It's going to be an all-volunteer group. We're looking for more volunteers. If you have any knowledge in audio or video, we encourage you to participate. You don't have to do it every Sunday. But even if you don't have any skills, we, we can easily train you and teach you um, because we have really dedicated people now, but we need you know, a handful of more volunteers. So please consider giving your time to this important ministry. Those are all the announcements that I have. There are many announcements in the bulletin, and I encourage you all to figure out how can you participate to be um, giving of your time and talents, but also sharing in the community of this great congregation. Please join me now in the prayer of our church that we will read together. As members of Christ's body and of one another, unique parts of a beloved whole, we give thanks for this gathering and for the one who gathers us. May our time together bind us in spirit, strengthen us for service, and help us reflect God's love in all we do. Amen. siblings in Christ. It's been a joy and a pleasure to be with you this morning, and I hope we're, our paths cross again soon and that we'll recognize the risen Christ in the breaking of bread. 
As we leave this place, I encourage you to go forth into the world in peace, to be of good courage, to hold fast to that which is good, to render unto no one evil for evil, to strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honoring all people, to love and serve God and rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen.